Hello everyone, it is Rosie here. I'm um, just getting things set up. If you could just drop a comment that you can hear me okay. And you can also tell us where you are from. And if you are a member of a troop, include your troop number. All right, hello everyone. It seems like you can hear me, so we're off to a good start. We have a lot of friends joining us from all over. So hello, we're happy to have you here. So if we haven't met before, my name is Rosie. I am the camp director at Camp Coach Taba. Um, I'm excited for you to join me tonight. We're gonna be talking about outdoor first aid and how to prevent and treat common outdoor first aid situations that you may run into. Um, I am here. I saw a comment. Somebody is on from Yuma, Arizona. I am actually in Arizona today um, visiting my family. This is where I'm from before I moved to Western Pennsylvania. Um, so I'm outside. Um, it is May 28th. Can anybody guess what the temperature is right now in Arizona? And I will give you a hint, it is three digits. Somebody said 106, you are close. 80s, not quite. All right, we have 100, 90 degrees, 105, 103. Close, so it is currently 108 degrees outside in Arizona right now. Um, it feels pretty good. Um, what they say about the dry heat is true. It doesn't feel quite as sweaty and sticky um, as summer on the East Coast, but I do have my water bottle with me, so I'm gonna make sure that I stay nice and hydrated, and we're gonna get into that a little bit later. Um, so today we're working to earn our first aid patch. So we earn patches and badges in Girl Scout by discovering, connecting, and taking action. So today we're going to discover, we're going to learn how to be prepared when we visit the outdoors, prevent and treat first aid scenarios. And this is important for everyone to know. Remember, a Girl Scout is always prepared. We're going to connect, so we're going to learn more information about first aid in the outdoors, how this can be put into practice during your time outdoors, and we're going to briefly discuss Leave No Trace and how that also impacts outdoor first aid. Um, and we're going to take action. So we're going to do a couple things today. We're going to play a little bingo game, which we'll get into in a minute. We're going to create a packing list together for a day trip for your next outdoor adventure. And then... After today, you can go and educate those around you about first aid and common first aid scenarios that you might run into during your time outdoors. And then you're going to be prepared for your next outdoor adventure. You can practice leave no trace and be prepared for anything that might happen while you're outdoors. So a little bit about first aid and why we should learn first aid. So first aid skills are vital to helping others who may be in need or in crisis. So first aid has always existed in some capacity, um, people helping people. The term first aid first appeared in 1878 as a combination of the words first treatment and national aid, so first aid. And one of my favorite women in history is Clara Barton. So Clara Barton helped others understand the importance of medical supplies, how to administer first aid in emergency situations, and she passed 
on important first aid knowledge, and she played a really vital role in moving the nation toward greater emergency preparedness. So she really spread the knowledge of first aid and its importance, and she is also credited as the founder of the American Red Cross, which is an organization that provides aid to people in need. You can donate blood to the American Red Cross to help others in need, and they also run some pretty cool certification courses like first aid where you can learn CPR and first aid. They have a babysitter first aid course. So if you're ever interested in babysitting others, um, you can take that course to expand your knowledge. They do a lifeguard course, which is what we use for our summer camp staff um, and lots of other cool things. So I wanna hear from you in the comments. I want you to tell me who are your favorite women in history. So who do you admire most? Um, a woman that I really admire from history is Rosie the Riveter. She inspired my camp name, which is Rosie. So let's hear what you have to say. Harriet Tubman, that is a great woman in history. Abigail Adams, my mom. Oh. Serena Williams, Amelia Earhart, Rosa Parks. Awesome. All right. Keep it coming. You can never admire too many incredible women. Um, so as we go into tonight, we're going to need just a couple materials. Um, it's also posted in the description for this video. Um, so you're going to need two pieces of paper, a writing utensil, and if you have bingo markers, you can use those. You can also get creative. Um, you can use your writing utensil. You could use a highlighter or a marker. Um, I am actually going to use some do -si dos as my bingo markers tonight. So we're going to set up our bingo board. Um, I'm going to move a little quickly, so this is a reminder that you can pause this video if you need to, um, and then play whenever you're ready. Um, so what we're going to do first is you're going to get your piece of paper and we're just going to make our own bingo board. So this is what our bingo board is going to look like. It's nine squares. So you just draw a line across the top, make one big kind of square. Mine's more of a rectangle, so that works also. And then you're just going to draw lines through to create a little bingo board. We're gonna put a free space in the middle. I drew a heart, but you could add whatever art you would like, or you can just write free space. It is totally up to you. Okay, so once you have your nine squares, I'm gonna show you a slide here in just a second. It's going to have some different terms, and you are going to choose eight of those terms to include. So there's 12 on the next slide and you're just going to choose eight. So you're gonna choose eight of these. You're gonna write these words in your squares in any assortment or variety that you would like. And I'm going to create mine along with you. So I'm gonna choose a map. How about some water?
Okay, I'm going to leave it on the side for just a few more seconds. So you can pick out your bingo items. And again, you can pause this video, rewind, um, and then press play again when you're ready. So I'm going to bring it back to me. Hello again. So I have my bingo board here with all the items that I chose. So as we go through the first aid scenarios, um, you're going to listen carefully for some keywords. These are our keywords. And when you hear that keyword, you can mark it off on your bingo card. And if you get a bingo, you can let me know in the comments and you might get a shout out. All right. So we're going to discuss how to prevent and treat some common first aid scenarios. And as we go along, I want you to also be thinking of different ways that you can prevent and treat some common first aid scenarios in the outdoors. So the first one we're going to talk about is minor cuts, scrapes, bumps, or bruises. So an easy way to prevent this is to be prepared. So know the terrain you are going to be visiting. So you should be looking at a map while you're planning your trip in order to best prepare. And you should know the trails that you are visiting. And a really important piece of leave no trace is to plan ahead and prepare. So can anybody tell me what they think plan ahead and prepare means? So somebody said, take things you may need, check the weather. Yeah, so plan ahead and prepare is checking the weather, creating a packing list, knowing where you're going, setting goals for the group that you're going to have on your trip. And this principle really helps you identify and set goals for your trip. And so then you can also select the appropriate gear you will need for comfort and safety. Another way to prevent some cuts, scrapes, bumps, or bruises is to be alert and be aware of your surroundings. So taking notice to where you are, um, again, what you may need, where you're going. So in Arizona, I know I'm going to need extra water. So I make sure I have my water bottle with me at all times. Somebody said, have water and a snack. Look at the map ahead of time. Yes, all great things. So another really important thing is to always remember your first aid kit. Um, and for more examples on building a first aid kit and how to treat common first aid scenarios like cuts, scrapes, bumps, and bruises, you can visit our patch program on our website at gswpa.org. And you can watch Tia, who is one of our girl program um, specialists, basic first aid video. And she kind of goes through some of those scenarios with you and how to treat some common ailments. Next, we're going to talk about a sunburn. So how do we prevent a sunburn from happening? So a big way to prevent a sunburn is to apply sunscreen and not only apply sunscreen, but reapply sunscreen. So it's super important when we're outside and we're going to be in the sun or even on a cloudy day, you can still 
get a sunburn. So to make sure that you are always applying sunscreen and reapplying sunscreen throughout the day. Um, another big thing is wearing sunglasses. Um, your eyes can actually get sunburned. Um, so it's important to wear sunglasses if you are going to be outside and looking um, into a bright area or the sun is gonna be on your face. Another couple ideas are you can wear a hat um, while you're outside to help the sun from being on your face and you can wear breathable clothing. So the shirt that I'm wearing today is really kind of a breathable material. Um, so that is going to help you as well. Um, and then to treat a sunburn, um, one big thing is to give it some time. Um, another big thing that you can do is keep covered. So if you have a sunburn on your shoulders or your arms, the next time you go outside, wear clothing that covers that area um, of your skin and make sure that you also apply sunscreen. Um, and you can also apply aloe vera. Um, aloe vera is a plant um, and when you cut the plant open, it has this kind of goo that comes out um, and it feels cool on sunburns. Next, we are going to talk about dehydration. So one big key to prevent dehydration is drinking water. So drinking lots of water before, throughout, and after your adventure. So you make sure you're hydrated before you're on the trail, during your time on the trail, or anytime you're outside, and after the completion of your trip. And when I say after the completion of your trip, I mean anywhere from five minutes to five days after your trip. So make sure you're drinking plenty of water. Water's super important to help us stay hydrated and ready to tackle all of those fun adventures. Um, and drinks like soda pop or other really carbonated or heavy sugar drinks are discouraged due to the lack of nutritional value. Um, Water is really the best thing that you can have with you on your outdoor adventures. And depending on the length of your adventure, you might want to pack a snack or some food. So if you're going on an overnight trip, you are obviously going to need to plan and pack some food. Today we're just talking about kind of a day trip. If you're going on a day trip, you probably want to pack some snacks. So some trail mix, uh, granola bars, some other foods that are going to give your body the energy it needs to keep moving while you're outside, either on the trail or even if you're at the beach or sitting by the pool, um, it's important to stay hydrated and make sure you have some adequate snacks with you. And then it's really important to remember you're going to take breaks during your adventure. So you got to take breaks to rest, drink some water, have your snack, stay in the shade, um, especially here in Arizona. If you notice, I'm in the shade today. I'm not out in the direct sunlight, so that's going to help me um, stay cooler. And it looks like we have some bingos, so awesome. Nice work. All right, and then a way to treat dehydration is to drink water and have a snack, sit in a cool shady area to cool down and rest. And if necessary, if you are super dehydrated um, and you think you might have a heat stroke um, or other ailments, it's really important to alert local authorities that can come and provide help to you or the people that are with you on your adventure. So it's always a good idea. Um, remember, a Girl Scout is always prepared to have the number of the park ranger with you if you're visiting a park or and or to let another adult know where you are going and when you expect to be back. So that's really important. We let people know where we're going, how long we'll be gone, and when we should be back. All right. Ooh, we got lots of bingos. Awesome. Okay, three bingos. Awesome. All right, next we're gonna talk about poison ivy or stinging nettle. So I'm gonna show you a picture, tell you some fun facts um, about poison ivy and stinging nettle. Um, and in the comments, I want you to tell me how you think you can prevent this from happening. So on the left, we have two pictures of poison ivy. And it really kind of looks like any other plant from these pictures. So here's a couple of tips to help you identify and avoid poison ivy. 
Um, one, obviously, is to stay on the trail. So you're gonna stay on the trail. Um, you're gonna make sure that you're checking your map so you know where you're going. And with poison ivy, a way to identify is that it's leaves of three. So a saying is leaves of three, let them be. So if it has three leaves together, like in those pictures, just let it be. Um, the leaves can be smooth or they can have notches on the edges um, and they generally have a pointed tip. So um, something to look out for. In the springtime, they're usually red. Um, in the summertime, which is probably when these pictures were taken, they are green. And then in the fall, they generally turn a yellow or orange color. So somebody said, if you see it, go a different way. Yeah, if you're on a trail and you can avoid it um, by staying on the trail, you should do that. If it is overgrown on the trail for some reason, it might be best to turn around to avoid the poison ivy altogether. And then on the right, we have stinging nettle. Um, stinging nettle is common in Western Pennsylvania, um, which I learned when I moved here from our girl program director, Jackie. Um, so stinging nettle can grow two to five feet tall. Um, the leaves are really coarsely toothed, which you can see in the picture. They're pointed on the ends and they're several inches long. Um, and if it is a younger leaf or a younger plant, sometimes they are heart shaped. Um, and just a fun fact, I didn't know this, nettles are larval food for several species of butterflies, which I thought was pretty cool. So they're not dangerous to all, um, just to us. It's just gonna make you uncomfortable. So it's best to stay on the trail um, and avoid those and learn how to identify them. So a way to prevent poison ivy or stinging nettle, obviously stay on the trail, bring your map. Um, and another important principle of leave no trace is to travel and camp on durable surfaces. So trails in parks, um, in national parks, state parks, really anywhere, um, if there's a trail, they were constructed for a specific reason, which was to provide routes, um, one, to concentrate foot traffic, and two, um, keep us safe from things like poison ivy or stinging nettle. Um, another important principle of leave no trace is leave what you find. So this is important. Um, you wanna leave nature how you found it. Um, so flowers and plants should remain where they are. Um, and one thing that you can do is you can bring your camera with you and take a picture, or you could bring some supplies and draw a picture of some cool plants or flowers um, or even wildlife that you see when you're out and about on your adventures. And then to treat poison ivy or stinging nettle, um, you're gonna wanna rinse it with some cool water, and then you can apply something like a calamine lotion, um, that will kind of help you as it heals. One big thing is to resist scratching and itching, which I know is difficult when we have bug bites or a rash, um, but that will help it heal quicker if you leave it alone. Next, we're gonna talk about some bug bites. Looks like we have a lot of bingos. That's awesome. All right, bug bites. So we're gonna talk about some different kinds of bug bites, how we can prevent those and how we can treat them. So one way to prevent bug bites is to use bug spray. Um, so using bug spray, which is necessary anytime you're visiting the outdoors or there may be bugs um, around where you're gonna be. Um, one other thing that you can do is have a citronella candle um, or citronella oil with you and that generally keeps away mosquitoes and other miscellaneous bugs. And then also to wear appropriate clothing. So if you're going to an area where you know there's going to be a lot of bugs, um, dress appropriately. So wearing that long breathable clothing, they make specialty um, outdoor clothing uh, designed for you to be outside in warm temperatures. Um, so that's definitely something to think about and plan for as you go. And then to treat some bug bites, um, 
leave it alone. Again, so itching is going to make it worse. You need to let it heal on its own. Um, you can treat with some itching cream if you feel like you need it. Um, and you can also cover it. So sometimes if I have a big mosquito bite because um, I forgot my bug spray at camp, um, I can put a band-aid on it so then I don't feel as inclined to itch the area. Um, and if you have a bug bite, um, if it's a mosquito bite, it's probably okay. You can still alert the adult you're with. Um, if it is a tick, then you want to alert the adult that you are with. Um, and when you have been outside, it's really important to do a skin check at the end of the day. So you really want to check your arms and your legs, um, any exposed area um, when you were outside. So just checking the surface area, looking for any bugs, ticks, any bug bites. Um, and another important thing is after your journey to take a shower. Um, that's going to help you smell better and it might help rinse off any other um, bugs or things that might be on you. And at camp, if you noticed you have a bug bite or you have a tick, you would alert an adult or the camp counselor with you and they would help you or get the camp nurse to be able to help you. Um, with ticks, if it's crawling on your skin, you just flick it off, just like that, just flick it off. Um, a lot of times they'll be down on your feet or your legs um, and they crawl up so you can brush it off. Um, if it's attached to you, then you just alert an adult or your parent or guardian or a nurse and they can help you remove that tick. All right, how many bingos do we have? Nice, all right. Next, we're gonna talk about dressing for the elements. So when you spend time outside, it's really important that you're prepared. Um, and one of those things that goes along with that is having the appropriate um, gear with you. So one thing that you can take with you on a day trip is a backpack um, or a day pack. So you can take like a drawstring style bag or a small backpack with you. That can carry your water, your snacks, your map, if you're taking a compass, your sunscreen, sunglasses, all those really important things that you need anytime you're spending time outside. One important thing is your water bottle or a water filter. Um, depending on the length of your trip, the research you do ahead of time, you may need a water filter um, in order to get water when you're out on your trip. Um, and they make some specialty filters that you can get where you kind of pump the water in it and it filters it for you. Um, and if you don't know a cool trick, um, if you're in the outdoors and you're going to boil water, um, one way to filter it is to actually take a sock. So you take your sock and you fill it up with water and, and the water um, kind of filters itself into the pot for you to boil. Another important thing to bring with you, especially um, if you're going to an area where there might be some scarcity of light. So like if you're going to um, a hike and you know that there's like a cave that you can explore um, or things like that, you're going to want to take a flashlight with you. Um, or if you think that you might not be back until the sun is starting to set, you want to bring that flashlight with you just in case um, it does get dark before you anticipated so you can find your way back. You want to have proper footwear. So at camp, we wear closed toed shoes in order to participate in activities. Um, so that's a big thing. You want to have probably sneakers or even hiking boots, depending on the um, trail that you are taking for that day. And then you want to have proper clothing. So we've talked about this quite a bit. Um, but proper clothing, breathable clothing, longer clothing, if you um, know you're going to be in an area with a lot of bugs um, or things like that. And when you're out on the trail, it's super important to always remember to practice leave no trace. Um, so one of those things is how are you going to dispose of any first aid materials you may use? Um, and that is anything from a Band-Aid wrapper to gloves that you may need if you're applying some anti-itch lotion, things like that. So it's really important in your first aid kit to include a way to dispose of garbage um, so you can take like a sandwich bag, 
um, or something like that where you can collect your trash on the trail, even your snack wrappers, anything like that. So what you bring in with you, you bring out with you. Um, and you want to dispose of those properly upon your return. And if you're choosing in the next couple of months to spend some time outside, um, it's really important that you do some research. Um, some state and national parks that are open um, are cutting back on the garbage collection um, due to some things you know, happening. So you want to make sure you do your research ahead of time so that you're able to dispose of that waste properly. All right, so Somebody said they got a blackout. My mom says that's what a full card is. Awesome. Nice work. All right. So what we're going to do next is you're going to need now your second piece of paper and some sort of writing utensil. So that can be a pen or a marker. And we are going to make a small packing list for some essential items that you should always take with you on your outdoor adventures. So in the comments, if you want to tell me some items that you think you should always have with you on your outdoor adventure, and we can add those to our list. So I know at the top of my list is going to be water. Ooh, somebody said a compass. That's a great idea. I'm going to add that to my list. A flashlight. Water. Yeah. Food. Yep, depending on the length of your um, adventure, you may want to pack some food with you. And make sure you're also packing an appropriate amount of food for the people on your trip and for the length of your trip. So if you're gonna be gone from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., you probably are gonna wanna take two snacks and a lunch with you um, for everybody in your group. So that's definitely something to think about. A tent, yeah, so if you're planning on camping overnight, you may want a tent with you. So let's go through some essential items that you should always include with you on your outdoor adventures, and then we'll go into some other items that might be helpful for you to include as well. So essential items. We have a compass, which somebody said in the comments. That's awesome. Also a map, right? We want to make sure we know where we're going on our adventure. Sunscreen. Yep. So sunscreen and sun protection. So sunscreen um, and also sunglasses. So I'm going to write sunglasses on here. And you also want um, to find a chapstick that's going to have SPF in it as well um, because your lips can also uh, be sunburned. So that's super important too. So I'm going to add that to my list. All right, we have water on our list. Um, extra layers. So this is important when you're out um, on a day like today in Arizona, I would probably take like a lightweight breathable um, jacket or a longer layer with me um, for sun protection. Um, and if I was in Pennsylvania, I would probably take either a rain jacket or um, an extra layer in case it gets cold or the sun is really coming down and I wanna protect my skin. So I'm gonna put extra clothing layer. First aid kit, absolutely. And again, if you would like to learn more about what should go in a first aid kit, you can visit our patch program um, at gswpa.org slash patch program. And Tia has a video about some basic first aid and that includes packing a first aid kit. And one really important thing is you wanna take any personal medication with you. Um, so if you have an EpiPen or an inhaler, you wanna make sure that those are with you at all times and that somebody 
knows where you're going again or the person you're with knows you have an allergy or asthma and they can help you and assist you in case you would need it on the trail. So personal medication. Somebody said extra socks in case your feet get wet. That is a great idea. And we have a comment that says we take a safety blanket like the firefighters use just in case we get lost and it gets cold. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's a great thing to have with you. Um, a lot of times you can build first aid kits for your car. Um, so a blanket would definitely be one of those items to include just in case. And somebody said a phone, yes. So that is the last on our central items you should always include on your outdoor adventures is a phone or a communication device. Um, so at camp, we often use radios. Um, that's how we communicate with other camp counselors. Um, and if somebody is in need of first aid or anything like that, um, they can call either camp director or the nurse um, to come and assist them. So having a phone or a communication device and if you are going somewhere where you will not have service. Again, it is super important to let somebody know where you are going and what time you're expected to be back. And when you get back, you let that person know that you are safe and you are back from your adventure. So I'm gonna add phone to my list. And somebody said a safety whistle. Yeah, so that falls in some other items that you might find helpful on your outdoor adventures. So I'm just gonna keep adding to my list. Here's my list with all of our things. Um, I'm gonna keep adding some other items that I might take with me on my adventures. So one of those is a whistle. And we have a blanket on there, like was suggested in the comments, so a blanket. You may want to take a camera again so um, you can take pictures of wildlife or plants or flowers or trees or anything like that um, with you so you can take your camera um, you could take a journal journal and writing utensils if you want to journal some when you're on your adventure or if you have like a bird watching log or a plant identification log, so you can track those things. You could also take um, some coloring utensils like crayons, colored pencils, markers, um, so that you could draw some things that you see in nature as well. And one other thing that you might find helpful or you feel you may need, depending on the length of your trip and the severity of your trip, is a walking stick or trekking poles. Um, and those really just kind of help you get up and down hills um, and it kind of helps take weight off of your backpack and things like that. So we will add a walking stick to our list. All right, and what I'm gonna do, somebody sent an umbrella. Yes, yeah, so you can take an umbrella with you. Um, I generally leave an umbrella behind because of the added weight. So I take a rain jacket that has a hood on it and then my bag is waterproof um, and they make some specialty bags that you can put things like phone or radio um, inside um, to help prevent them from getting wet a magnifying glass yeah so a lot of um, compasses have a built-in magnifying glass so if you uh, find a compass like that um, might be a good idea to bring that along with you and that's a very cool way to find bugs too. Okay, so I'm flipping my paper over and on the other side, I'm going to write an outdoor first aid checklist. And this checklist um, was given to me by Katie, who is our vice president of program and property. Um, and she has some really helpful rhymes and tips um, for outdoor first aid. So we have Number, we have six that we're gonna go through. So you can label your paper however you would like. Um, I'm just gonna start adding, so I'm gonna add number one. So number one, I'm number one. 
So in other words, is the scene safe? So when somebody is in need of help, you are checking for things like electrical wires, wild animals, if there's deep or rushing water, um, if there's a fire nearby, if there's a stranger, anything like that. So number one is I'm number one. So you're also looking out for your own safety. Um, so checking your surroundings of things just to make sure that you're also safe so that you can provide first aid. If you are unsafe, then you can't provide first aid. Number two, you're asking what happened to you? So in other words, what happened? So you're looking around to find other helpers, ask the person needing help if they're okay, how you can help, what happened. Um, and a big thing is looking for other people that might, have, that might know what happened or that can also help you and step in. Um, one really important thing is that the person with the highest training should be the one stepping in. So at camp, that's our nurse. Um, so they're the one taking care of everybody um, because they have that specialized training and they know how to take care of people in the best way possible. So number three, we have not on me. So what that means is you're going to put gloves on or some personal protection equipment um, and you're going to protect yourself from any germs. So number three, not on me. So we can go back through these quickly. So number one is I'm number one. So in other words, is the scene safe? You're looking around, you're checking for rushing or flooding water, deep water, a fire, any chemicals, strangers, wildlife, electrical wires, um, anything that could potentially pose more danger. Number two, you're asking what happened to you? So you're assessing what might have happened to the person in need. And you're looking for other people to help or identify what happened to the person in need so that you can better help them. And number three is not on me. So we were putting gloves on. Um, if somebody's giving CPR, a lot of times they have um, like single use masks now that you can, um, I have a keychain that I carry with me. Um, so I would use that um, to help protect me. So you're protecting yourself from things like germs. Number four is, are there more? So number four, are there more? So this is looking around seeing how many people are injured, what types of injuries they may have, um, and really just, again, assessing the scene. Number five, we have, how can I help those alive? So this is something you're checking to see what kind of help the person needs and how you can provide help or what help you need to call for. Um, so this checklist is really to be used for anything. So if somebody had a minor scrape, you're still going to go through all of this checklist in order to help them. Um, so number five, how can I help? What kind of help does the person need? Maybe just a Band-Aid. Um, so that's something to look for. Um, and then when you're looking for the help they need, if there are other people around that can also assist you in helping the injured person, um, direct them to call 911. Um, so when you are performing first aid, it's really important to delegate out to other people things so that you can stay focused. Um, so you're trying to help the person, you're maybe asking them what happened to you, you're putting your gloves on, and you're looking for other people and you're saying, hey, call 911. When you call 911 um, and you want to be able to tell them as many details as possible. Um, even if you don't know what happened, you want to be able to tell them as many details as possible. Um, so if somebody falls on a trail and they need help, um, that is more than just a basic first aid, and you're calling 911, you're going to tell them it looks like they're bleeding or they're not bleeding, they're breathing, they're okay, their eyes are open, they're talking, this is what happened, this is where we are. So you're giving them as many details as you possibly can for them to find you and help.
So number five was how can I help those alive? And number six is become friends quick. So in other words, you want to establish a relationship with the injured person. So you're going to talk to somebody in an emergency. Um, this really helps bring down panic levels for both the person you're helping and yourself and others involved. Um, so you're going to have a conversation, things like asking them their name, where they're from. Um, again, if you can see what happened, what they need help with, and even just keeping them talking. So anything, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite ice cream? Anything like that. Um, and by doing this, you really lower your own heart rate and the heart rate of the person that's injured, and you're going to help them feel comfortable until help can arrive to take over first aid. Okay, so we can go back through those really quick in case we missed anything. So number one is I'm number one. So is the scene safe? At this time, you're checking for other things like water, wildlife, fire, strangers, electrical wires. Number two is what happened to you. So in other words, what happened? Um, you're looking around, you're finding others that might be able to help. Um, you're asking the person needing help what happened. Number three is not on me. So this is putting on your gloves, um, a mask, anything like that. And this helps protect you from any germs. Number four, you're asking, are there more? So is anybody else injured and what kind of injuries do they have? Number five is how can I help those alive? So how can you help somebody before um, emergency services happen? Anything like that. And then you are also telling somebody to call 911, and when you tell somebody to call 911, you have to be specific. So you have to have some identifying factors. If you know their name, use their name, or something, hey, you in the blue shirt and tan pants, call 911, and you're pointing at them so they know that you're talking to them. So you're gonna call 911, and you're gonna provide as many details as possible. So. It looks like there's bleeding from her knee. There's no bleeding, they're breathing, they're okay. Um, their eyes are open, they're talking, they're not talking, their eyes are closed. All of those factors, um, any descriptions that you can give. And number six, which was become friends quick. So in other words, you're going to become friends with the person you're helping. Um, so asking them questions, keeping them talking, that's gonna help everybody stay calm. So the person you're helping and you, um, and it makes everybody just feel a little bit more comfortable until other help arrives, should you need other help. And we have the amazing Jess and Krista in the comments tonight replying and adding in some links. So they're adding in some additional resources. Um, so they're adding in some resources about first aid in the outdoors, um, Leave No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics, things that you should pack when you go to Girl Scout summer camp, um, and a Girl Scout guide to camp in the outdoors. And we have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this summer. Um, so this summer, we're gonna have a camp at home program. Um, so that is going to include some really cool themes and sessions. And in the comments, um, Krista and Jess are going to link our website so that you can check out the offerings for this summer. We have things from eco badges to space science badges, cooking badges, and more. Um, and you can join me, Rosie, the camp director for Camp Conchataba, Onyx, who's our camp director at Camp Hawthorne Ridge, and Zelda, who is our camp director at Camp Sky Meadow. And we will meet four times a week. Um, we're going to complete fun activities, expand our knowledge, learn new skills, and celebrate with some camp at home. So you can visit our website at gswpa.org to learn more about our summer reimagined. And I want to hear from you if you've had a chance 
to check out our Camp at Home programs. I want to hear what you are most excited for. Ooh, somebody said a pocket knife. Yeah, that's not a bad idea to have with you. Okay, somebody asked, when does it start? So registration opens on Monday, June 1st. Um, all registration for all of our summer camp programs starts Monday, June 1st. And our first week of camp is June 15th. And our last week of camp is August 3rd. So from June 15th to August 8th, um, we're going to have two different sessions running each week. So our first week, we have Eco Extravaganza, which is um, earning all of the Eco badges, and you'll get to spend time with all of your Girl Scout sisters um, on the Zooms. And we also have Outdoor Art, the Art Rageous Outdoors, um, where you can earn your Outdoor Art badge with Onyx, who is our camp director for Camp Hawthorne Ridge. Somebody asked, can out of council Girl Scouts register? Yes. So our summer reimagined camp at home program is open to all, um, any Girl Scout from any council, and you do not have to be a Girl Scout to register. Um, so you can, anybody can register. I know one session that I'm really looking forward to is our some more fun session and we're going to stir, whisk, and create all of our own camp inspired meals throughout the week. Um, our summer reimagined camp at home is also going to include a family fun night on Monday night um, so you and your family can join us, um, the camp directors for Girl Scouts Western Pennsylvania. We're going to play some games, um, get to know each other, have some fun. And then on Wednesday, we will also have a virtual campfire. So we'll all get together. We'll sing campfire songs. We can talk about s'mores, other campfire desserts, all of those fun things. And again, that is on our website. So gswpa.org. We have all of our different summer reimagined camp at home sessions up there. We have lots of different topics that we're going to cover. So again, our first week we have Eco Extravaganza, which is the Eco Badges, and the Art Rageous Outdoors, which is our outdoor art badge program. The second week we're going to have our Out of This World, which is Space Science Badges, and we have a session titled World of Girls, where we're really going to embrace our entrepreneurship and innovator skills, and we're going to build our own outdoor products, learn about um, business plans, how those are created, the outdoor industry. It's going to be tons of fun and I really hope you join us this summer. Registration opens Monday, June 1st. It's open to all Girl Scouts from all councils and any girl, so you do not have to be a Girl Scout to register. And we will meet four times a week, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday um, is a set time. And then Friday, we're going to have an all camp um, ceremony where we kind of end our week all together. Um, and all of those times and descriptions for each of the sessions with some activities we'll be doing is on the website. So check that out. And if you have any questions, you can contact our customer care team or any of our outdoor program team um, and we would be happy to help you register for Camp at Home. That's all for me today. Thank you for joining me. I hope you learned something new about your adventures outdoors and how to be prepared um, and prevent and treat some common outdoor first aid situations. Um, so thanks again, and I will see you soon at Camp at Home. Goodbye.